Addendum to File Electronic Correspondence Between Viktor Perlinsky and Shialak Zisav Fourth for All War Shiz, we launched it today. Oh my god, it's a beautiful thing, and yes, I know I owe you a crate of pineapple, and yes, I will fall upon my knees and sing the stupid song of apology in front of your elders for doubting you. And no, I do not care at all if you were joking about that. We're already prepped to lay down another keel for the second of its class, and your eggmate has already proposed a few ideas that we're running up the chain to get implemented to save time on construction while keeping the integrity of the project. I know I said it was going to look ugly, and on paper it does, but seeing it out here, it's a big beautiful baby shiz. I was in the room with the Admiralty, and by the way, did you know there's a Chua Admiral now? Anyhow, they were talking about how they are already designing destroyers and frigates, and apparently after they launch the last six daily class corvettes, they are going to switch production entirely at the Mars orbital shipyards. Shiz, it's beautiful. The second that power plant turned anyone who had anything to say shut up. It's huge but agile, and it's deadly as all hell. Just like you said it would be. They are going to onload the crew on Earth Station, and it's going straight to Thermopylae. Oh, by the way, something else. That thing you kept talking about? It's a go. I overheard the Admiralty talking about it. They're going to build a shipyard near a moon called Titan next to Saturn, and they are having four suborbitals built to build up the modules they are going to put into place on it. End addendum. Personal recollection of Tiziki Kunazikia Kakietkata, also known as Tika. Senior Ambassador to the Galactic Senate. Head of Diplomatic Relations Council. Tarinika Conclave. Log has been partitioned for study by Diplomatic Relations Council. Third partition. Begin log. I finally turned my attention down from the mural on the wall to the human who was waiting at the end of the ramp. And although I had comforted myself on the entire journey in with thoughts of tombs, it is still a bit disconcerting to see what is so obviously a predator looking at you. His uniform was a stark contrast to United Earth uniforms I had seen before. While theirs had been a pale blue, the human in front of me was dressed in almost midnight black. United Earth military uniforms had a pleasant, almost soft look about them. Apparently the ship design was not the only thing to change. This Terran front officer was all sharp edges and creases, and I took particular note of the pistol holstered at his hip. I almost took an involuntary step back when I met the human's eyes, like two of my aides did. They were narrowed, the pale-skinned man's brow furrowed, and based on what I could remember from interacting with tombs, he was not happy to see us. I paused for a moment, then dipped my head slowly. Ambassador Tika, the human seemed to bark out. I am Commander Nathan Andrews. I am here to escort you to the observation deck in the Hadrian segment. There was barely veiled hostility in the tone. I felt my feathers along my wings and back flatten, and glanced to my aides. I was very thankful the tombs had told me long ago we were hard to read. My aides were standing stock still as statues, and I trilled softly to calm them. This was a species that I knew, or at the very least thought I knew, well. To my staff this was a brand new species that they had never interacted with before. Some of them began to come around, slowly moving their necks and adjusting their wings. I began walking down the ramp and bowed my head deeper. All around my shuttle, humans and every now and then a Chua were milling around speaking. Most of them wore what I took to be maintenance gear, bright oranges and silver reflectors gleaming. Some of them had stopped, looking in our direction. Commander Nathan Andrews, it is most certainly a pleasure. Thank you for your time and courtesy. Lead on at your discretion. The commander practically snapped, turning ninety degrees. Attend, he called out and as I continued down the ramp I noticed the eight camouflage humans and two Chua, wearing what I could only assume to be infantry fatigues and body armor, carrying rifles that probably weighed as much as I did personally, save the Chua, who carried what appeared to be smaller versions of the same. My aides fell in line behind me. I stopped beside one of the Chua. The small reptilian was wearing fatigues very similar to the humans, but I could see heating elements braced around the uniform even along the long, thick tail. It does my heart's glad to see your people again, I said as heartily as possible, lowering and craning my neck to meet the Chua at eye level. The Chua did not look my way, its eyes on the side of its head with pupils drilling a hole into the back of the human's legs in front of him. When I heard of the Vral attack on your homeworld, 
I feared the worst for your people. I am glad to... I noticed that the noise level in my area had dropped considerably about the same time as the Chua's fingertips paled from the grip he had on his weapon. I looked up, seeing almost all the rest of the work around us had stopped, and all eyes were looking in our direction. My entire body went rigid, and even though I didn't know what or how, even though just moments ago I had warned my staff about this, I knew I had done or said something incredibly taboo. I saw hands tightened into fists, my eyes darting around as some of the humans were even slowly lowered as if they were ready to rush us. Some of the Chua actually had their teeth bared in a threat display, and almost all of the humans were glaring shivs at us. I had a flash of tombs from so long ago in my head talking about how humans expressed emotion facially, and rapidly I tried to place it. I slowly leaned up and backed away from the diminutive Chua soldier even as I heard the report of hard shoes hitting the deck of the hangar approaching, knowing it was the commander. I couldn't take my eyes off the people surrounding me. My head snapped to the side to look at the commander. Okay, so if you ever see one of us looking at you like this, Toombs had said to me all those cycles ago, while furrowing his brows down, flaring out his nostrils, and curling the side of his mouth to where one of his little fangs were visible. This means something has disgusted us. The more pronounced the change from normal, the more of a mistake you made. If you see a square up on you, and especially if our skin color changes a little, that means something else entirely. I had asked him to demonstrate, and he had stood up. When he did and showed me the same facial features, I had laughed and taken a step back, but even when it was tombs, even when he was just having a bit of fun talking about the differences in our species, the way he was standing, the glower in his eyes, the warping of his face, it had all been enough to send a quake down my legs. As the commander's boots hammered down on the deck and he looked down at me, I saw the flushed skin, the curled lip, the glint of his fang behind it. Contempt. That was the word Toombs had used. Contempt. My legs were locked, I couldn't look away. It was fascinating at the same time I wanted to run back into the shuttle and get off of this station as fast as possible. Please refrain from engaging with the crew, sir. Commander Andrews said, his tones clipped, his facial features slipping back into a mask of placidity after a few moments where I watched as his lip twitched. Yes, of course, my humblest apologies, I said quickly. My staff huddled together behind me and I glanced around at the group that was watching us. The commander started walking, our escort following a few moments later. Suddenly I realized without being told that it would probably be best if I kept up. The humans in Chua in the hangar simply watched us leave. The doors to the hangar opened and another wash of cleaner air fell over us as we entered the station proper, but I wasn't looking around anymore. The hallway was brightly lit, which I was glad of. The commander's voice sounded from up ahead. We are approaching the Hadrian Junction in a few minutes. We will go through a slight gravity shift, as the inertial dampeners are adjusted to the orientation of that subsector. If you have difficulties, please inform me immediately so that I can assist you with the transition. As we turned a corner near the end of the hall, I could see what he meant. I saw the deck at almost a 45-degree incline compared to what we were at now, and I watched as a human far in front of us grabbed hold of a hanging guide rail from the ceiling. They shifted themselves holding the guide rail until the conflict in gravity, pushing themselves along with their feet and using the rail to keep themselves centered. A Chua a few steps behind her simply hopped into the air, kicking his feet out, and landed on the opposing deck without using the handrail at all. I decided to myself that I would try the Chua's method. The commander reached the handrail and actually just pulled his feet up and swung one-handed before planting himself firmly on the walkway and turning to look down at us, our guard all seemed to have different methods of doing the same. Not to be outdone, I reached the hallway and did exactly as I saw the Chua do. I gave a small hop and kicked my feet out to the inclined floor in front of me. When the force pulling down suddenly became the force pulling me what felt like sideways, I tried not to panic, but I landed on the walkway and looked up towards my team. They all followed suit, one at a time, and to my pleasure none of them fell or needed assistance. Once we were all on the same plane of gravity, the commander started walking again, and I fought down a sudden hit of nausea from the shift that had just happened that seemed to come from nowhere. 
The hallway we were in now was a bit tighter, the flooring more tiled and less laminate. The walls were angled at the ceiling, and there were far more structural support tresses than in the hallway we had just left. Commander, I take it that we are on one of the hulls that was placed around Thermopylae, I asked, just to do something other than walk in silence with my stomach and gizzard in knots. She defended us first as the Hadrian, a combat cruiser in service during the Second and Third Wars, he said, not turning his head to look at us. During the later stages of the Third War, the Hadrian sacrificed herself and her crew, putting herself between Thermopylae and a graviton bomb. He stopped at a passageway intersection. The blast broke the back of the ship and ruptured the forward reactor. The sternward half of the ship has become Thermopylae. This way? He motioned down the hall, and as I turned I saw an open door, and outside of its space. I stepped through and took a breath as I realized what I was standing in. The observation deck was nothing more or less than a segment of the hull that was completely missing and covered with what appeared to be a thick layer of what could have been glass for all I knew. I could actually see, standing on the edge of the hull, a massive railgun cannon just to the side of the observatory. Ambassador Tika to Renika Conclave. I heard an almost melodious voice call out, and my neck craned to look for the speaker. I bowed my head and extended my wings in a gesture of acknowledgement and humility. Finally, someone who wasn't looking at me like I had just ruined their day. A marked uptick. The speaker was a human in a much more elaborate version of the uniform the commander was wearing. A female of the human species, her hair was gray, and her eyes didn't hold the off-putting glare that her kin had shown. Standing next to her was a chua in much the same uniform, but markedly different to accommodate for the differences in size and the way they held themselves. Fleet Marshal Angela Simmons, Commander of Thermopylae. I've heard so much about you and have been awaiting meeting you for some time, I said. The human smiled at me and I finally felt myself beginning to relax. As have I, but I believe your information on me is a bit out of date. I have been relieved of my honored command of this station and will be taking my next post shortly. She motioned to the Chua at her side. May I present Field Marshal Vicot, the newly appointed commander of Thermopylae Station, the Chua bobbed its head once to me, welcome station. My second Admiral Reynold, stay good. The Chua motioned to a much more gentle-looking human to his side who saluted smartly. I apologize. My translator seems to be having difficulty. I said, I don't believe I'm getting all that you are saying. For the first time, I realized that I had not once ever been in a conversation with anyone in the Chua species at all. Fleet Marshal Simmons laughed. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. The Chua likewise seemed amused. He gave a slight chirp that didn't translate, then motioned to me. Chua, no words fill conversation, direct, pointed, always. He bobbed his head once, then looked back to Simmons. Like I said, I wouldn't worry about it. Everyone seems to have a lot of filler words in their vocabulary to the Chua people, she said, looking back to the diminutive fleet marshal Vicot. He calls it flowery language, but really it's just a lack of vocabulary that they simply never found the use for. Anything that dresses up speech, pretty much. True. Halftime talker silent, the Chua said, and I trilled a laugh along with them both. I felt all the dread and anxiety from my journey here and the walk to the observation deck falling away. When I heard I was going to meet with a military representative instead of a full ambassador, I did not know what to expect, but these two seemed pleasant enough. Both of them canted their heads to the side as an announcement came over the ship's communication speakers. Now hear this, UTFS Antares arriving in theater in five minutes. Prepare for scheduled broadcast. Excellent, Simmons said, and her Chua counterpart nodded once. I hope you don't mind a bit of theater, Ambassador. I looked back at my aides, curling my neck and rustling my wings slightly letting them know in my own way that all was well. I love theater. The fleet marshals walked to stand beside me and nodded once to Commander Andrews, who turned and with the guard, moved to stand by the hatchway we had come through. I noticed the door to the hatch was still open, and as I turned back to the fleet marshal, her head was turned up, looking through the dome over our heads. A few moments later, Admiral Reynold came to her side and offered her what looked like a handheld transceiver. She cleared her throat, then looked down at her Chua counterpart, 
who was also looking at the stars and ships beyond. After a moment, she held down a button on the receiver. All hands, this is the fleet. Cease all activity and heed my words. Ninety years ago, we joined in common cause to fight back against cruelty, malice, and indifference. We engaged an enemy that had not found an equal, which found pleasure in inflicting pain, who had enslaved and viciously murdered any who stand against it. She did not stop talking even as I glanced back over my shoulder as humans started coming through the hatchway, making way for Chua in their midst. The fleet marshal stopped, then continued after a few moments' pause. We were beaten back. We saved as many as we could. Eziak, Zizma, Shivru, and Aza all fell. Simmons looked down at Vikot, who only looked out at the stars. Finally, we were pushed back to Antares. We could not defend Antares, but Antares defended herself. For a year and six months, the brave men and women of Antares stood against the Vral, and with their defiance it gave us a chance, a singular chance to shore up the walls, to meet the tide, to make a fortress against the invader, to light one last candle against the darkness. No one spoke, even as more and more people came into the observatory. It was quickly becoming crowded, and as it did, we noticed that Commander Andrews and his guard were coming to form a circle around myself and my staff. Or more appropriately, a barrier. The fleet marshal started to speak again. You stand. We stand. All the humans and the Chua stomped their feet and yelled at once, causing me to flinch from the suddenness of it. Simmons continued speaking, having given them time to repeat the affirmation. In that fortress, the bunker that has safeguarded our homes and our sanctuaries, the shield that has protected us, the bulwark forged from hundreds of hulls and millions of lives spent to give us a fighting chance. You stand, we stand. The entire station seemed to thrum with the sound and vibration of stomped feet. In the halls your fathers did. In the weapons pods your mothers did, tending the reactors your grandfather did, manning the flight deck your grandmother did. You stand, we stand, repairing wounds in hulls that died long ago, eating in mess halls that have served billions. You stand, we stand, ready to meet the threat of the invader, the enslaver, the butcher, the Vral. Fuck the Vral, the shout came from somewhere I couldn't see and there was a sudden thunderous roar of approval and the floor seemed to vibrate with the stomping of feet. The voice had carried over the receiver to Great Mother alone knows how many years. They are not my type, soldier, Simmons quipped, chiding, and for a split second I thought there was going to be a disturbance, but the laughter from the humans and the chittering of the Chua next to Simmons made me blink. After a few moments of letting the laughter die down, she continued. Every man and woman, every mother and father, every egg mate, every spouse, every child, every hatchling, all of us. We have made sacrifices and dealt with hardship. We have experienced loss. We have seen lives that should have been full of promise cut short. In 90 years, we have spent 78 of them under siege. We have bled and died, won and lost. We have suffered so that one day we could stand here, in this station, for this moment. My neck snapped to the back as the light cast by the Kelvin system seemed to get swallowed, plunging the observatory into artificial light. My eyes widened as I looked up through the observation screen at a hull that was so enormous it dwarfed the already terrifyingly large vessels that we had flown in and around. If the sight of the battleships had filled me with dread, the sight of this almost struck the life from me. Dark, jagged hull segments were interlocked with railguns and laser batteries the size of destroyers, missile pods that were on display coming out of hull plates with more warheads than I could count, and more weapons the make and model of which I couldn't even begin to understand. It was an absolute avatar of war. It had to be as large as the station itself. The entire deck was completely silent, and I couldn't pull my eyes away from the sight of the horror overhead to look at their expressions. Suddenly a small vibration was felt on my side, and I reached for a small pouch on my belt. I noticed all of my aides were doing the same. I pulled out my small data pad, and on the front was a message from my attaché on my homeworld asking if we were aware of the signal being transmitted. I opened the message and heard an almost muted version of the very speech I was listening to, only with a few seconds delay. This speech was being broadcast to the wider galaxy. I quickly input a reply letting them know that I knew of the address and to stand by. 
Simmons suddenly began shouting, bellowing into the receiver, and my head snapped to look at her, seeing fresh tears streaming down her face. Let the memory of all those years serve as an example to us all. The dead cry out, the living cry out, and to those who are held in bondage, know that we have never forgotten you. We have refused to forget you. As we ride out, we will hold fast the sacrifices that our ancestors made for us and that we have made for those who come after. Officers all over the deck were trying to keep people from shouting, and for a few moments I was afraid we were about to be swallowed by an absolute riot of fervor. Our people do not cower in fear when faced with the cruelty of this galaxy. We do not yield when we face the indifference of some in it. We stand. We stand, came the thunderclap of a response. We stand, Simmons yelled again. Again came the response from what seemed like the entirety of every soul on the station and in the fleet overhead. Simmons' voice cracked as she roared the declaration again, and the affirmation was simply deafening. And we are still here. She thundered into the receiver. The humans seemed to erupt. The Chua were lifted onto shoulders as Simmons held the receiver up, keeping it keyed so the sound of the fleet could echo into the galaxy. I suddenly realized I was huddled with my staff together in a tight knot. The fleet marshal reached up and made a motion with her hand. Quickly the noise began to die down, others repeating the gesture, quieting each other as all eyes looked to Simmons. She was still holding the receiver down. I felt like I couldn't breathe. I was staring at her with my beak hanging open like a complete dullard. We're coming for you, she hissed into the receiver, a threat and a promise all the same. All hands, she suddenly yelled. Prepare to ride. Prepare for war. She held up the receiver again to a cacophony of noise. She held it up even as she knelt, and Fleet Marshal Vicott grasped her finger and patted her hand. She nodded to him before looking to me. Finally, she let go of the receiver and handed it off to Admiral Reynold. She began stalking my way, an expression on her face that suddenly made me feel like I was about to be not just killed, but devoured. I backed up, running directly into my staff who were huddled behind me and almost squalled in terror before I realized she wasn't heading for me, but for the door. I heard Vicott's voice over the station speakers. All fighters undock host carriers. Prepare disembark fleet. Fleet Marshal Simmons paused next to me even as Commander Andrews was making a way for her. I looked up at her. Toombs' lessons came back to me as I saw her expression. Disdain was etched onto her face. Disdain for me. Disdain for everything I represented. She had masked it all before, but it was now on full display. I slowly tried to straighten but felt like I had the ship that was over our heads parked on my chest. Her lip curled into a sneer. What's the matter, Ambassador? I thought you liked theatrics. 